Hi, welcome to European News Weekly. Um, I'd like to uh, bring, a, bring you today to our new guest, uh, who is uh, Gordon Smith, uh, who's uh, known as the Psychic Barber. He's uh, written books, uh, he's traveled the world, he's, he's world-renowned. Uh, he's done interviews on uh, mainstream media and uh, many of the spiritualist magazines. Uh, he's done podcasts uh, discussing uh, matters of a spiritual nature. Um, and um, we've got him here today, uh, thank heavens. And uh, he's basically going to uh, be talking about a variety of subjects um, to do with, uh, with spiritualism and, uh, and with the environment and various other issues. Um, so welcome, uh, Gordon, uh, to the show. Thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Excellent. And we've also got Jimmy Hagen here, who's my uh, co-host, uh, and he's doing the uh, recording and all the techie stuff. Uh, hi, Jimmy. How are you doing, Sean? And how are you doing, Gordon? <laughs> good, to, good to meet you, Sean and Jimmy. Excellent. All right. Okay, so I, I think I'll start off first. Um, we're going to bring in, uh, we were just talking about uh, an issue, I suppose it's fresh on our minds, uh, to do with um, uh, the Edward Snowden revelations, uh, obviously with Julian Assange and uh, uh, with um, WikiLeaks and their releases. And uh, we were talking about uh, the intrusiveness of uh, GCHQ, NSA. Uh, we were talking about uh, various issues to do with confidentiality. Um, and so basically, uh, I would say uh, to you, Gordon, you know, at the moment, the Samaritan's call center, uh, this is all recorded according yeah. to Snowden's revelation. And uh, we also see that, uh, you know, uh, children, online children's counseling, which is supposed to be confidential, yeah. is all is all uh, metadata. So they know who's doing it, where they are. They know the content as well. So obviously, Edward Snowden says they scoop it all. Uh, and obviously, the UK is also bringing in incredibly stringent um, uh, uh, new sort of Orwellian laws, um, uh, which we'll be discussing in a later podcast with Birgitta John's daughter from the Icelandic uh, Pirate Party. Um, so, uh, Gordon, the, the question to you, I suppose, would be, you know, in matters of confidentiality, in, in matters of intrusive uh, surveillance, uh, where does the uh, sort of spiritualist uh, sort of movement stand with this? Uh, because obviously you do uh, confidential uh, readings with people um, and uh, they can be accessed through a mobile phone or in a, you know, in a number of ways of surveillance. And, uh, you know, how do you stand with this? Well, first of all, I think everybody has a right to privacy um, regarding their own life and certainly questions they have, whether it be for a counsellor, a medium, a priest, anything. And within spiritualism, I mean, there is a great deal of um, respect for confidentiality and mediumship. First of all, I, I wouldn't ever um, perform mediumship over a phone or anything like that because I, I, that I don't really feel works very well. And also, it, you are opening yourself up to the powers that be that can listen in. So to me, I would always only work with people on a one-to-one -one basis, face-to-face. -face. But equally, no matter who they are, I've sat for many people of very high standing. And it would never feel right to me anyway to, to divulge anything that came out in a reading. It's almost like a confessional in a sense, Sean, that, that these people come to you in private, therefore it should remain private. And if anything, I tend to forget most of the things that happen because it's not really important to me. It's really them coming to, uh, you know, for counsel in a, in a sense. And it wouldn't be wise to spread that around, no matter who it is. So I really believe that people have their right to privacy, no matter what, especially when they're the ones who, who kind of initiate a reading. If they come to me, I would never, you know, make it public or uh, I would never pass on any information that I felt was personal about another person. Sure. So, I mean, in th that's obviously an opinion that you have. Um, and it's uh, held by the uh, other mediums that are in the spiritualist uh, movement uh, and healers, obviously. Yeah. And so, uh, what? What's did? You know, obviously, you've done things like trance mediumship and and what have you. And and have you? You know, and obviously, you have a good contact with your guide, and you have since you were a child. So, what what uh, what sort of uh, feeling do you get uh, from them uh, in terms of? Uh, uh, I suppose we were talking about remote viewing, which is something, yeah. Uh, that you... I think, in honestly, Sean, in honesty, Sean, it's really more to do with um, having a sense of honour, um, and that's what I would pick up from the spirit world, if you like. That if I did something dishonourable, um, then I, I would I would feel it. We have conscience. And our conscience would tell us if we are breaching something. 
Um, and that's how I would feel the spirit world would, would let me know if I were about to overstep a mark. I would get a feeling about it. That's the nature of being sensitive. Um, but I think in spirit, the spirit world themselves would respect anything with honour. Um, and anything less than that is human practice. And it's usually people doing it for their own end, which is non-spiritual. Um, when people are actually using information to further their own career or gain money from it or in, in this day and age, I suppose, with the technical side of things, grabbing everybody's information. Um, how spirit would have a say on that, I don't know, but I think it would be down to the individual and their conscience as how it would report to them, does this feel right or does it not? Part of my practice as a medium is to be self-aware. So, so being self-aware tells you immediately that doesn't feel right to share this stuff or, you know, to nick somebody's information. And uh, you obviously mentioned uh, Madeleine McCann as well. Um, so uh, basically, they were saying that some clairvoyants had been trying to uh, access uh, information to do with yeah. that. And how, do, how does that fit? Well, again, um, in such a sensitive case as the McCann case, as a medium, I would never, ever want to go anywhere near that case unless the parents themselves asked. Once again, it comes back down to their willingness um, or their need, if they felt that that was an option, then absolutely I would have a go to try and help the family. But there's a lot of mediums mislead people, mislead the police by phoning the police and saying, I know where the body is and I know this and I know that. And in actual fact, it's all a load of rubbish. Um, and it's a lot of very deluded people trying to cash in on the thing, get themselves a name. It's, it's amazing what people will do, how our, our own human nature can be very corrupted over something like that. Um, and once again, that comes back to mediums who are undisciplined. Um, but it's a wrong thing to just try and tune into somebody's life because that's intrusive. If someone doesn't ask for a reading, then no one should be volunteering information to them. And I suppose the fact that uh, nobody's actually been able to uh, find or come up with uh, good evidence uh, concerning yeah. this, uh, that would sort of say to you that maybe spirit would not allow them to no, do that. They absolutely wouldn't. Um, and one of the reasons I say that is I have worked on many cases like uh, the Madeleine McCann case. Um, some I have got absolutely nothing shown. And that tells me spirit are not willing to give up information. And it's not mine to say what's right and what's wrong in that situation. I, I would just go with my feelings there. Um, and as I say, sometimes I will get very accurate information to help a situation. And other times, you know, you get absolutely nothing, and that would tell me that when the spirit want me to work, I, I can be productive and useful. But if it's not going to work, it means that whatever I do won't affect the case in any good way. Sure. So, sadly for the Maddy case, um, you know, I was asked by people to do it, not by the family. So, to me, as long as they have nothing um, from a medium that says their kid is not any longer living in this world, then they still have hope. And who is anybody to take that away? without being asked, that's, that's, I think that's quite a, a horrible thing. Right, no, and, and um, I have to say, um, I was uh, talking with uh, Robbie earlier, and he, he was mentioning that you've got a new book out uh, to do with child bereavement and how children in the family react to that. And uh, could you um, sort of uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that while we're on the show? Well, well this is my, my first attempt at fiction using uh, my experience as a medium and all the many years I've worked with families who have lost kids and, and how the other siblings are affected through no fault of their own, sometimes the family tend to lean towards the dead child and they, they start to honour the dead child and, and as I say, not through no fault of their own, it's part of grief and they kind of maybe don't explain things properly to the other child. So I had this idea to write a book um, that would try and point out life, death, life after death, grief um, through a story um, and the story all finds itself in nature where the little boy whose sister has died basically being ignored by his parents. And he literally, in this very inner world, starts to tune into nature. And he, he learns a new language called sense. And only children and animals can talk sense. And he learns through these animals that he meets about how they cope with death and, how, and life after death and so on and so forth. But it brings up a lot of different issues about grief and, um, and, and also about communication with children, how much they know, how much they don't know, how much they should know, things like that. But um, what I've tried to do, which I took great advice from a lot of um, people who worked in children's hospices and things, who deal with a lot of broken families, and uh, they all said, try and, try and bring something through that allows the kid to express his emotions in this book. And I've certainly done that, because I think that's what happens. A lot of people put the kid's emotions to one side, and um, the kid's not getting a chance to express their grief. 
because they're also feeling the parents' grief and they feel guilty if they say anything and so on and so forth. But I really hope that this has a strong message to to parents to say to them that it's whatever's going on in your life, whether it's a divorce, whether it's grief, no matter what it is, that communication with a child of a certain age really has to be something you look at. Okay, so could, could we see uh, Gordon Smith, the uh, sort of Harry Potter of the spiritualist world? Then? <laughs> well, if you saw Gordon Smith as a J.K. Rowling's, I'd like it better. <laughs> <laughs> True. All right. She wears so, much better shoes than Harry Potter does, Sean. Um, <laughs> is, is the book uh, aimed at children, teenagers? Well, it's aimed at... Um, the, the character in the book is, is nine going on ten, and um, that age and upwards. But I think a lot of the adults that I've given the book to proofread before it comes out, they're just loving it because of the, the as I say, the emotional content of it. Good and bad, it's taking it up and down, the emotions. So I, I think it appeals to adults as much. I think if there's some adults reading this book to a child, then I think they will get more engrossed in it than the children. <laughs> Excellent. Well, well, we'll leave a link uh, on the... I, uh, I take your word on that. If it becomes the next Harry Potter, I will reward you duly. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to change your name to J.K. Rowling or something. Yeah, I need a J.K. before my name or something. Like that. <laughs> <G> <laughs> a P.R. or a J.S. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have that link uh, to, to the book um, uh, on the, uh, or to your website, which yeah. will no doubt have yeah. the links. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, Jimmy, uh, I think we were going to go on to environmental issues. Uh, do you want to well, put we your were question indeed, but While we were on life and death, um, and um, I, I was watching a little uh, show on life and death there on YouTube, and um, you were speaking about the uh, everybody has this sort of like uh, inherent ability to contact spirit. And obviously I'm quite well aware of it because I do have a little bit of a, a background in messing around with the occult in my younger years and stuff. So I, I'm aware of the disability to, to contact spirit in, in loads of different ways. Would, would, would you care to go into that like a little bit um, about these abilities people can access if they so wish? Absolutely, Jimmy. I think everybody has a sixth sense, I would say. Everybody has six senses. And the sixth sense lies dormant in a lot of people. And maybe they only have one or two experiences of it during their lifetime. Someone who's a medium like myself, that would have been um, awake, very young in me, which it was. But I think everybody who's had a loss, first of all, psychologists and people would say that you probably long for something. And that's true. That's not a lie. Everybody does long for that piece of communication. But it's when something otherly happens, Jimmy, when it's something that it's, it has a quality like if somebody has a dream that's not just a dream there's a quality to that dream where they've maybe touched their loved one's hand or they've felt them or heard them then there's every possibility that that is real just because it happens in somebody's imagination and their dream doesn't make it not real it might be real to them there's many people who find things and you know they're talking about the loved one's favorite song and it comes on a radio carl Jung synchronicity but i think the spirit world and this world are very very connected and in order to have access to it then you have to be aware of your sixth sense which is that sense beyond the other five the sense of knowing that sense of feeling and i think that's what a lot of people get and maybe misunderstand it. It's very misunderstood, the sixth sense. Because the minute human beings find it or access it, they want to use it constantly. And they think the spirit world can then give them answers to all things, which would not be, again, that would be against a natural law. The idea is you have to live here, but we are not the first people to try and contact our ancestors, Jimmy. They've been doing it since man was on this planet. That's so true. And in a sense there, you're bringing up like a very, very important point here on um, on the occult and how it can take over someone's life completely and, and, and drag them down a rabbit hole and into a kind of a, a world that's not real. And uh, you start to, I don't know what it is, like I've seen some people go totally mad from um, experimenting and getting too Absolutely. deep into it. Have you noticed much of that? <laughs> Jimmy, do you know what I do when I take any class that I do now? Um, the first thing I try and do is take the mysticism out of mediumship. Um, and when I do that, I'm basically talking to people about their own mind. I've had years of experience in people who have lost the plot, who, have, who are no longer grounded because of their thinking. And it's their thinking that becomes so real to them. And they actually believe everything that happens in their thinking mind is true. And it's not. They, certainly it's true they've thought about it, but it's not realities, it's a different reality. So my job is to make plain to people the things that that are um, in some way worthy of the spirit world and what is actually of the lower thinking mind. 
because that's where you'll get all your hauntings and all that. No such thing as a haunted house, guys. Remember this, only haunted people. <laughs> and when you see that, take people out of your house, it's no longer haunted. So it's people who are haunted, and therefore that's more to do with the mind than the spirit world. I, I'm, could, they, they're obviously people who are in some distress too, like, and obviously they're they're in need of healing as well. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a very very deep topic that, and um, I I do get um, very very fearful for people who go too deep down that rabbit hole of spiritualism. And it, like you said, it, it's a it's a good idea to remember to stay a little bit grounded in in the real world. Yeah. Well, you see, Jamie, the thing is, spiritualism itself, the religion, is actually okay because it is a religion. It's practiced in churches. They have ministers. They have grades which you can work towards where you will be vetted. So that side of it's okay. It's when people start to practice things away from an organization and they start to delve into their own mind. And remember, that there's nothing to fear but fear itself. So the minute people, and that's where your occultists, when they've crossed the line within their own mind, that they will start to drudge up their own inner demons. And these are only concepts, remember, these things are not real, only real within the mind of the person who's allowing it to actually manifest within them, out with them, and it has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on the spirit world. Uh, well, actually, I, I think I'm going to, because we're still on this topic, we'll leave the environmental issues for the second, <laughs> um, because this is getting interesting. It's um, a special environmental question. <laughs> absolutely. Now, I know, I know that um, you've basically had uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, studies done on you in Glasgow University by Archie Roy, who's, uh, who produced some papers uh, concerning your, your talents, if, if you want to call them that. And um, also Chris French, the skeptic, uh, who yeah. tried to uh, debunk you um, and <laughs> failed miserably. Uh, well, nobody's going to debunk me on the first night, and certainly not if they don't buy me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Did he buy you a drink? No. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm joking. I'm <laughs> don't get debunked on the first night, Sean. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, well, when we're talking about that, um, obviously it's it's just to give your 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 uh, the, you know people out there that may not be into this uh, some sort of uh, credibility. But um, yeah. those people, certainly people that listen to this podcast, are very science minded. Yeah. And uh, there's been a report recently about uh, science and dimensions, uh, uh, talking about the fact that uh, you know science now is is getting to the point where they're they're sort of thinking that there may be other dimensions around us that interact with us. Um, yeah. uh, so, I mean, uh, have you have you sort of looked into that sort of area? Um, obviously, the, the 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 physics world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my son uh, studied astrophysics at university, so I was surrounded by that. And his teacher was Professor Archie Roy, who was a physicist. So I've been surrounded by physics since I was young. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, my understanding is that that is how the spirit world, in the correct moment, will actually unfold to the mo a modern world, that, that it will be in some way understood through science more than through religion. Um, because religion is a very personal thing to each person, whereas science itself opens up questions that open up other questions. But the, the good thing is, is that as a medium, I understand that there are energies, and, and that word covers a million things. I don't like that single word, but that there are different atmospheric changes around me as a medium when I'm working, um, where I feel intensities, and then I'll feel very kind of lightnesses and different tones and grades of energy, if you like. And I'm trying to understand that at the moment and how it affects me when I'm working. Um, I mean, think about this. God, you, you're only going back to, I think it was 1908 when they, when they came up with the Geiger counter or something like this, and they can measure radiation in the air. Well, to me, all these things that are in the atmosphere around us at some point will be understood or they will be, be able to be measured. Spirit being one component of that, I'm sure it will. Absolutely. There was, right. a, okay. there was, an, interesting, interesting. There was an interesting it's... comment that, uh, that I've heard many years ago about science and religion, and it was described as being they're both approaching the same answers, but it, they're coming at it from two different directions in a kind of a circle. I think so, but the other thing with, with religion, uh, Jimmy, is, is the emotional content that's attached to that that might keep itself away from the scientific fact, because there's a lot of people very romantic about their religious beliefs. Um, and that sort of romanticism, I think, can kill fact. And, and if we, I, I would love in my lifetime to see something factual that is recorded through science. I don't know if you guys are aware that last year there were tests done on telepathy, um, where some, some guy had um, wired his, his brain up to 
a computer and I think he was using a similar technology to the prosthetic limbs um, and what he did was he tried to think of an object and send it out through his computer to see what it was picked up and it was picked up by other computers. Now that in itself, if, if, we, if we can start to then understand telepathy as, as an extra faculty of our human being, that will change a lot of the world. <laughs> right, that's, that's a fantastic answer. Um, so, I mean, when we're, when we're looking at, uh, at these issues, yeah. I, th I think, uh, what was I going to say? The, I th I th uh, with, with healing, um, I sort of just wanted to touch on that at the moment. Yeah. So obviously we're talking about clairvoyancy, talking to the dead, telepathy, yeah. this kind of thing. Uh, what, what's your kind of take on healing and, and what, what's the kind of science that you understand is being done in terms of peer review or in terms of investigation? Well, he healing's another one of these things like mediumship today that, uh, that is um, regulated uh, quite, quite strictly. Going back to some of the healers I knew, before these regulations came in, I mean, I knew healers who could literally X-ray a body. They were they were phenomenal people. They they could diagnose and things like that. Now, having said that, nowadays the the healing restrictions and I think they're quite right because so many people are now involved in it that you have such a mixture of mind in it. So I I, I think it's a wonderful thing that we are in some way monitoring that because a lot we're leaving it to the general public, somebody who believes they're a healer because they've done a, a little course, can then, we wouldn't want them to diagnose illness. They're not doctors. They've only done a healing course. They haven't done seven years at medical school. So where there's a natural healer, Sean, somebody who, who is born a healer, um, these people should, I, I would love to see more tests done on them because they, they have a faculty that, that isn't in any way normal to most human beings. I think we all possess a little bit of abilities to heal. Certainly we heal ourselves all the time. And some actually have this extended ability that can heal other people. And some that, as I say, that can see illness in people or, or any kind of break in a bone or so many, so many different x-ray things. But it would be wonderful, I think, to have more scientific tests done on it. Those that are done at the moment actually are quite favorable. Um, they show where people, patients who didn't even know they were being healed, were being healed quicker than patients who were not being healed. And I think that same test was done with prayer, where people who were prayed over or prayed for got healed quicker, whether they were aware of it or, or not. So, I mean, there's been quite a few tests done into healing. I do believe healing is an amazing thing when it works and when you put the right practitioners. But sadly, with most of the things connecting itself to spiritualism, um, there are now probably millions of people around the world taking part as opposed to the chosen few going back maybe even 50 years ago. It's, it's really changed. It's now a fad. Right. So, I mean, um, and, uh, while we're, I suppose, I suppose we started off with GCHQ, intrusive surveillance and, and, uh, and, and why that's not right in terms of spiritualism. And, um, I, I was going to just quickly bring us, uh, while we're on the topic, because it seems uh, a, a nice run to do with, um, uh, Germany and France in Europe. And we're in the mm. EU, obviously. Um, uh, and that they've got, uh, there's a big pushback against clairvoyance and healers mm. and uh, alternative therapists. Um, and uh, in, in in the UK, indeed, you, you've got a, a new law that says that you have to say that this is uh, not real or this is pretend. You know, this is an act or whatever. When you, when you when a clairvoyant gets on the stage, um, would you like to sort of fill us up on any details that you know about that? Any updates from Europe or or any of that situation? Well, um, as far as Europe's concerned, Sean, I work there quite a lot. Um, and it certainly hasn't filtered its way through to the organisations I work with because we still at this point aren't um, in, are being insisted that we show any kind of, um, you know, sort of disclaimer or anything. I think they will get there and I think that's just in line with what we're doing in Britain. Um, and I, I think they're quite right. What they're looking at more, I would say, with that kind of disclaimer is for those who are doing like phone line psychics. Um, where there's mailing things in magazines and stuff like that, because there is no kind of structure to that. Uh, nobody can vet that. So I could set up stall tomorrow at the back of a, a woman's magazine and, and offer phone readings. So there's nobody really regulating that. And I could be anyone doing anything, you know. Um, I'll tell you, I laugh actually a few years ago, I was asked, offered, I was offered, wait to hear this, $8 million to do phone lines uh, in America. $8 million to take phone calls and, and use my name and my face um, as the, the kind of clairvoyant who you could phone. And, and that was a vast amount of money. Everybody thinks I'm absolutely stupid and mental for turning it down. But again, it's not ethical. And I would not put my face or name to anything that's not. 
you've got to remember the public here, and that's as, as any decent medium or healer will tell you, their work is for the public. And we, that that's what we have. We have a, a, an ethic uh, in what we do. We have ethics that, that say we couldn't in any way dupe people for the sake of money. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to do that. And I know in Germany and places like that, there's so many alternative practices out there. There's, there's not so much mainstream religion, Sean. It's mostly... Um, people who are doing courses in angel workshops, um, energy workshops, all these things that people come up with, these new buzzwords for things. But the sad thing about it is that there is no regulation of it. So I don't think it's a bad thing that governments are actually taking note of it because within the probably many, many thousands of people who take part, you won't have a lot at the top of that who are genuine. You'll have a heck of a lot who are unscrupulous, who are just using it as a means to, to make money. Or to be important, to look important. Sure, well, you do. You do seem to have a lot on the internet, and uh, uh, I certainly did ten year investigation. But yeah. I, my, with my with my investigations, they were face to face sort of uh, readings, you know. Yeah. So uh, that they seem to be the best way forward with, uh, and through the Spiritualist Association yeah. of Great Britain and uh, various other uh, sort of uh, organisations that were available uh, uh, to me. So. Uh, <laughs> There's this act, that, that the Consumer Act that came in. Remember what that replaced, Sean? That replaced the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Now, the Fraudulent Mediums Act was set up in 1951, I believe. Um, and basically, for the government to say that they have set up a Fraudulent Mediums Act, by law, they're literally saying that there are genuine mediums out there. And I think that's one of the reasons that they repealed that in 2008 with the Consumer um, Protection Act, because basically the law said that there were genuine mediums out there. They were actually giving credence to mediums and saying these, these mediums are genuine. But to be in some way seen as unscrupulous, you could be tried under the Fraudulent Mediums Act, which by its own nature only replaced the Witchcraft Act of 1735. Hmm. So, so I think that they've had to shake up the law. It's not a bad thing to regulate things. And I think if you're a genuine practitioner, it doesn't matter to you. It really doesn't. You know, I've been in churches where somebody's had to read out um, this disclaimer saying this is a form of entertainment. Now, at the end of the day, people come because they want to come. And if it's in a spiritualist church and people are charged a five or four to see the medium or 20 quid, whatever the, the, the cost is, usually that money goes to the church or a cause. Okay, there are those who don't, but there's a lot of us who do do it for charities and things like that. But the fact that they have to read this out, is, is it's neither here nor there to the person that's doing it. I, I tend to not even really listen to it because I, I know that I've been doing this for years. I'm coming from a, the best place I can to do this. Um, so it doesn't actually bother me. It's not just once. No, no, so at, at the end of the day, though, it's, it, it really is an important point about about regulation in, in, in the field, because having watched a, a few of your YouTubes and um, when, when I look at some of the people who um, you make contact or as a spirit gets in contact and, and, and you focus on someone in the crowd and you, you can clearly see that their their heart is basically in their mouth they're, he's gonna he's gonna speak to me and they're, they're clearly distressed you know and as there's a lot there's a there's a lot of sense in keeping rogue charlatan mediums out of the out of the game really in a Absolutely. sense yeah well you know you only have to look at somebody like the the entertainer Darren brown the Darren can set up anything and as as a fraudulent medium basically he's doing this on television to show how fraudulent mediums work <laughs> by its very nature he is fraudulent as a medium because he's, he's he's using information before he works any good medium who actually does this doesn't we do not go and get information before we start. But what Darren Brown's highlighting, it's really easy these days to Google things and find things out. And 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 again, I look at that and think, well, good for you because you're highlighting the the, the fact that there not everybody out there is trustworthy. And just because somebody makes a claim, then I, I would be very um, loath to tell people just to go to any medium. Never do that. Make sure the person you're going to has a really good reputation. Um, and, and you can do that these days. You can read up all sorts of things about people um, on the internet and, and get some background information if it's in a spiritualist church. Ask the people. Every spiritualist church knows it's good and popular mediums. They know the ones with ethics. They know the ones that are sincere. And they'll know those who are a bit bitty. Mediumship's like everything, Sean. It's, you're going to have your very good practitioners. You're going to have your mediocre. And you're going to have your downright awful. 
Absolutely. Um, all right, well, let's change tact a little bit then. Um, I mean, uh, Jimmy, you're going to do the environmental question now. Sure. And, uh, yeah, yeah, because I, 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 this is one, though, I'd, I'd never personally uh, seek a, a medium myself. Well, I can't see it like that, that I ever would, but now that we have you on, Gordon, uh, a thought that springs to mind is like, especially with a lot of the environmental pollution which is going on on the planet at the moment, and tomorrow uh, also is the anniversary of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and there was also the Gulf oil spill, and so many um what what i would term as sort of like crimes against the planners and I've, my question would be basically uh in terms of the consciousness i always seen the, the planet as being a conscious entity and d does it ever send messages to you and um uh, and uh, give you um thoughts or or, or or ideas about how it feels about what's being done to it by uh, for, through the effects of human interaction with the planet well, I certainly think that we have um, changed and adapted away from the natural side of human beings. And we have become much more uh, technical in things. And therefore, the, the, it's the things that we create that are causing the planet distress. Now, this planet is a living being. It doesn't talk to me in that way, Jim. But w what I do feel, I actually feel the, if you like, the shift in the consciousness, the shift in the the balance, if you like, of the planet, because this is a living planet. The planet's the thing that is alive, and it's because it's alive, we're alive. And the thing is, is we are bleeding it to death of its oil, its blood, if you like. We are rearranging the, the very structure of this planet. I think that will have effects. I would assume that the course of man is still going to live within the effects that man has caused himself. Um, and, you know, the rights or wrongs of it come out and, well, do we want to keep progressing as human beings? But the more human we get, the less spiritual we get, and the less, if you like, connected we, uh, connectivity we have to the planet, the more we start to think that we depend more on nuclear energy, oil, and we don't actually realise without the planet, we've nowhere to use these things and we wouldn't have an existence. So we need to start being aware of the actual planet being a living being that produces life constantly every year she gives us more so i would say that there's definite effect but that effect will be felt in our children the children of this world are very scared and they're scared because of you all know, the the information they get and they're scared that a lot of that information points to the a, a world that will run out of things that they're already used to so fear itself is something that might come out of this and that might be the cause and effect we rape the planet of things, there's a conscious feeling of fear in the planet, and that must affect everything that lives on the planet. Very, very, very interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah, so in a sense what we're seeing could in, in fact be this fear is a, is a karmic effect of our own interactions and of, with what we do to the Absolutely. planet. Absolutely. When you think of what karma is, Jim, karma is just, it literally just is action. So therefore an action we make will have an effect later, any action. So every single thing, every action that's been taken at a place in this world by anyone at some point will be answered for. And it's not a hellfire and brimstone. It's nothing to do with God in that sense. This is to do with us working away, thinking we know what we're doing, when in actual fact we don't have the foresight to see the, the karmic timeline that by doing this in a hundred years' time, that will happen. We don't have that. Not everybody, some people might. But... Uh, as, as a world, we don't have that. As, as, as a, a species, we do not have the, the insight to know what our effects today will have in 100 years. All right. And so obviously we're talking about negative aspects of what's going on in the world in, in terms of our human impact in, in, on the environment, so whether it's uh, Fukushima and how the, there's still 100,000 people that are uh, displaced internally there and uh, uh, they're, they're being very much sidelined, you know, um, and uh, we've got BP Gulf oil spill, many people with cancers and, uh, you know, the, the large corporations uh, just paying people off uh, with, uh, you know, gagging orders so that yeah. they can't talk about it. Um, there's activists fighting against all these different things. And um, so basically, um, I, I just wanted to get your, your feelings on, on all these activists that are, uh, you know, largely the target of GCHQ and all these sort of people. Mm. Um, and and uh, how do you feel uh, about about what they're doing, uh, about the hardships they suffer uh, around the world, you know, imprisonment and, uh, and worse? 
Um, how, how, what, what's your impression of, of the, the, the oh, I'll use the word activist loosely, the yeah. activist um, uh, sort of movement uh, that's, that seems to be building up, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, in the world? You know, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I, I think it's a good thing that people are waking up. I, I, I've, I've used an expression for the last 10 years, wake up and smell the karma. And um, I really wish people would, because, you know, the more we actually start to see this world and we can actually see more now happening around the world than we ever could before. And I think it's tweaking people's conscience. And I, I think that's a good thing. The very fact that, again, activists, this, these are karmic people. That's what the word means, act, activity. So people who are actively doing something are compassionate and they are using active compassion. The sad thing is, is the truth always comes at a price. And anybody who finds a truth, who finds something in, in, in this world that maybe we are not being told, there will be gagging orders or worse because the, the powers that be are not ready to tell the public what's really going on. And, and as long as we have people at the top who don't want to give that information out, then you will find activists will be awake and will be doing things and sadly will be persecuted. Sadly, it's a very brave person who puts their life on the line to, to make awareness of things for other people. So I take my hat off to them, I really do. But you know, the sad thing, Sean, is I think of the old uh, Chinese book I used to love, the Tao Te Ching. And one of the things it said many, many, oh God, when was it written? Two and a half thousand years ago, when Lao Tzu says, if you over-educate the public, there will be anarchy. <laughs> <laughs> but th that's the same guy that really had no human rights for uh, women. Uh, <laughs> so I think. Oh, yes, but... I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I think I think they had some uh, quite restrictive uh, ideas about women. Although um, the the strategy of family life was uh, was uh, appreciated, you know. I'm not sure if it's the same Lao Tzu we're talking about. All right. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. It's an old hermit that lived out. Supposedly, we say this, we don't know. But apparently, he was some old hermit who lived out of the world. I don't know how political he would have been. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, uh, you know, so obviously we're talking about uh, sort of these matters, but um, sort of bringing it uh, sort of into sort of more more sort of uh, modern times, and um, uh, we're sort of you know we're I, we both live in myself and Jimmy, we both live in Ireland, um, and say, same sex marriage has been uh, sort of uh, uh, admitted to be a legal thing. You know, it can happen now. It's uh, broken. It's helping to break down a, a lot of prejudices. Um, it was uh, very well received by many, many people in Ireland and uh, I, I know that you uh, travel between Scotland and, our, uh, and the UK um, and uh, in, in concerning sort of uh, gay rights and uh, these sort of issues uh, basically what, what do you think um, is the situation uh, in the UK and in Scotland is there a difference as well? Um, I, th I think people are just becoming a bit more open to the whole thing and actually I think people are caring less about it um, than caring more about it so I honestly believe that, you know, left to its own devices, the way it's going now, I think in 10 years' time, nobody will even be talking about this. I really don't. Because I think people, the people who really kind of made these strides forward, if you like, were the people back in the, the 60s, 70s, and so on and so forth. My, my uh, older cousin, who is a gay man, has been with his same partner for 50 years this year. Quite a long time, 50 years to be together. And um, he was telling me last week when I spoke to him that back in the, the 70s when his mother died and her body was lying in state in the chapel, that the priest would not ha allow him access to the chapel because he was a homosexual. And now look at that, that's only, that's only 40 odd years ago. And you think, good God, look at how it's changed since then. It has changed. Okay, you're still going to get bigots, you're going to get ignorant people who don't have a clue. Um, but I think a big part of the population don't really care. <laughs> Well, sure. I, th I, th uh, I well, think, though, um, because, like, you know, a, 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 there's been a lot of uh, chatter about the, the marriage thing, but in fact, like, civil unions between two men or two women were never outlawed in this country. No. I think the problems no. really stemmed from uh, from points of law where people were trying to, uh, say, uh, give their, their belongings to someone else in the event of a death and stuff like that. And yes, people things were like that. And also there was tax breaks for married couples that gay couples couldn't get because they couldn't get married. Things like this. That I think they should, 
everybody should have the right to these these advantages if they are advantages everybody no matter who if you're a working adult and you have the right to to you know <laughs> leave money to your partner or, or gain a better tax break because you're a married man and you live with another male then you should be entitled to that same thing yeah there should, should be no there should be no laws denying anybody bequeathing their belongings no. to anybody you know <laughs> you know it's, it's I think this is one of these laws guys that that as i said the nature of things as people advance I mean, and we are advancing a lot too. We keep getting a bit down on things and negativity of the consciousness of the world and stuff. But actually, people are evolving at a massive rate. And as I, I honestly don't come across this as a gay man. I don't come across such prejudice anymore. Having said that, I'm not out there throwing it in people's faces, which I don't think people should anyway. But I, I don't see the same prejudice I did 10, 15 years ago. Right. So... Um... Okay, so the the next little bit I'd like to talk about, really, I, th I think, is um uh, is your work in London, which is I think in the London Spiritualist uh, Mission, which is a a kind of a, a should we say a bog standard sort of uh, spiritualist church. Oh, where well, the there are... people there would not like to be called bog standard. <laughs> <laughs> a very special spiritualist church. Yes. <laughs> I do know some of the people in there, so I should be a bit careful. But, um, but it's it it really has the you know you have the services uh, which uh, include sort of a a prayer and then basically uh, clairvoyant getting on the stage and and just coming to people um, you have uh, classes and these sort of things uh, yeah. um, uh, how, how do you feel that the developments of the spiritualist church is there more to do um, is there uh, is the format that that's there within spiritualist churches within the UK um, uh, are they sort of um, should we say are they are they basically uh, standard you know are they do, do, do you think that there's improvement or do you think that, that they're kind of where they should be well um, I suppose the philosophical answer is they're exactly where they should be but for me I, I see the change that's happening in people um, who come to spiritualist churches and remember spiritualist churches literally took the model of Christian churches that's all they did they just copied the same model People came in, you said a prayer, they sung hymns. Sometimes they would read a piece of philosophy and then the medium, this was the part, their communion. The medium would commune with spirits to get evidence of life after death. That's the standard uh, uh, practice, which is very similar to a Christian service except for the mediumship part. So I think people themselves might find that whole um, format a little bit stayed now. And as many, many people now fall away from the, the orthodoxy, I, I think people will want to see change in something like a spiritualist church. Because spiritualism is open to be able to do what it likes. Now for me, the teaching side of it that I do is to run awareness classes to make people aware, spiritually aware, self-aware, and to try and teach a lot of common sense in it and take away the mystery, is what I said earlier. I don't want mystery attached to this. There is nothing mysterious or occultic about a mother who's lost a child and wants to feel a connection to the consciousness of that child that's not occult and it's certainly not any mystery that's a human need a human natural a kind of order that you still want to know they're there and if a spiritualist place can offer that or attempt to offer it then we will attract that type of people for help spiritualism itself is moving towards becoming a, a little bit more in line with counselling where a lot of mediums now go off and take counselling courses and things so that you're not just coming to see a medium you might be coming to talk to somebody who can help counsel you through your grief or somebody who's ill or whatever where the healing's concerned so it's, it's actually changing but i think it's a kind of organic thing it's starting to change by its own nature the people who used to run spiritualist churches a lot of them are actually now passing into the spirit world and there's a new a new order if you like younger people who who i feel feel that that setting has to change and there's no anarchy or anything about it it's just going to be a natural progression i think and uh, how, how do you reach out to the uh, the, the sort of various uh, minority groups and uh, different denominations and uh, you know all this kind of uh, uh, the, you know sort of wide uh, sort of uh, uh, demographic that we that you would see in London or, or uh, in most cities uh, and even wider afield? Well, I think where well, London's concerned itself, Sean, that um, the demographic of the the church that I go to in, in Notting Hill. Um, is quite varied. We have a real eclectic mix of people and a very wide range of different cultures. 
<clears throat> and I think because there's not a dogma as such in the church, it doesn't you know, claim that they are the only thing, it doesn't demand that people have to do anything. So it's very open to people, it always has been. Um, and I think the services, the church services are, are always pretty reasonably attended these days and, and we're a massive mix of people all coming in and asking questions about what is spiritualism because a lot of people still don't even know what it is in this day and age. So I, I, I think the church's location helps us to actually bring in a wide sort of demographic of, of different cultures, different religions, different backgrounds because we're not objecting to anything. We're just opening the doors. Well, I mean, I've got a little personal question for me. I mean, I used to work with the Daily Mail and... Uh, yep. Uh, I, I used to deliver the, the first off the press papers to the editors, and uh, and then one day I discovered uh, that you actually got onto the Daily Mail, uh, yeah. <laughs> and they they had gone up to debunk you. You were going to be the second medium that they were going to debunk, and uh, and it doesn't seem like that actually worked out for them the way they wanted it to. Um, is, is there any sort of little background to that that you could give us uh, on the show? Um, Sean, as, as far as I'm aware. Um... So many journalists have, have interviewed me over the years and different people have been interviewed by psychiatrists, psychologists, God knows what. But I've always just remained as open as I can with people. Um, you know, and, and journalists especially always try and hoodwink you and they think that there's something you're hiding. And I think if I'm really honest and frank with people, then there's nothing much they can write about you other than what you've said. And, and I cover the fact of people can cold read. I was a hairdresser for 23 years. I'm damn good at cold reading. Trust me, I beat Chris French in a test at cold reading. And um, Professor Chris French. So I know I can do all of that, but cold reading itself cannot make you produce somebody's dead father's name or the day he died or how he lived or how he died. You can't get that through looking at another human being's body. Not exact details in that. When that happens, a lot of the journalists go away sympathetic which is actually a nice thing. And I would assume the Daily Mail journalists did that because yes. so many of them set out their stall to say, right, we're going to get you. And then they leave thinking, oh, actually, I don't think he was doing that at all. And that, that's, that's a nice thing. As I say, because I've been open to doing tests with scientists, with sceptics, what have you got to lose? What are they going to do? Call you a fraud? And they can't do that if they have no grounds to. So no. it doesn't bother me. I, I don't think my ego really uh, needs needs that much fluffing up these days. Mm -hmm. Done it too long. <laughs> <laughs> Careless. Anyway, have you got anything uh, to sort of uh, finish off with, Jimmy? Oh, all my points have been covered now at this stage, and uh, I, all I can say is, Gordon, it's been fascinating. It's been a really interesting, frank discussion, on and and open and honest, and and it's perfect, perfect. Thank you. It's, it's lovely to chat to people. As I say, it's part of my life to sit um, and discuss spirit and the world and life and life after death. So the more I can do it, the more we, I hope that it touches people's minds and it touches their hearts and it, it keeps them in contact with with a living world, with the life that's all around us. It's not just about you know, the, the physical body. We are, there's life in the air, guys. <laughs> all right. And for, for our Irish viewers, um, because I, I've, I'm a, I've been over here and the spiritualist uh, movement in Ireland seems to be, uh, well, a bit thin on the ground, shall we say. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there are uh, clairvoyants and healers. Uh, there definitely are healers around. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we, will uh, we be seeing Gordon uh, Brown uh, at the uh, at some Gordon sort Brown. of lodge? Um, hey. You mean the previous minister? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going out. You beat me to it there, Gordon. <laughs> yeah. Who's Gordon Brown, Sean? Do you know, you're not the first person that did it. I once came off a plane in Gatwick and there was somebody standing with a card saying Gordon Brown and it was actually me they were looking for. So you're not the first one. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I, I mean, I personally have been asked several times recently to come to Ireland. I used to work in Ireland, and uh, I wouldn't mind coming back. Uh, anyway, I love uh, Ireland, I love Scotland, I love the Celtic countries and, and the connection we have. So I would be more than happy to come over to Ireland and work with people. So. That'd be great. Well, we'll just we've just got to finish off Irish water first, and and, and then <laughs> then make it. Then, then we'll have a bit of time for you. <laughs> Irish water. What's that? Uh, that's a cor corporate takeover of our water because. Um, oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. Well, where it's uh, it's um, when I came over to Ireland as opposed to the UK, um, I noticed that uh, people over here are very vocal uh, about their rights and about. Yep. Uh, constitution uh, in the uk people are kind of a kind of oppressed because they go to a demonstration they have a police camera in their face they're being tracked by yeah. their mobile phone um and uh, the irish uh you know obviously uh, seem to seem to be of a stronger nature um but um i i would uh, love to see you over here and uh, i think there's a need for a promotion of uh, of uh, these types of uh, ideas 
and yeah. uh, it'd be nice to see you come over and uh, promote them brilliant okay guys well good luck with what you're doing keep doing it Bring all right the information to people is a wonderful thing all right thank you very much uh Thanks, gordon and, uh we'll look for maybe see you in the future for another i hope so sean nice to catch up with you again sometime and jimmy it'd be nice to meet you too pal. you too gordon take care my friend take care god bless Bye -bye. See ya.